Good morning. I'm Paulo Osório from Portugal, and I thank Abraline for the opportunity of introducing this lecture. This is another initiative of Linguists Online. This event is an initiative of a Brazilian Association for Linguistics, Abraline, uh, in cooperation with the International Committee of Linguistics, Latin American Association for Linguistics and Philology, ALFAL, uh, Argentine so Society for Linguistic Studies, uh, Linguistic Society of America, European Society of Linguistics, and Linguistics Association of Great Britain. I stress the importance of being a member of Abraham. Uh, we now have the honor to listen to, prof to Professor Emmanuel Nguyen, and we to thank, thank him for his availability. Thank you. Uh, Emmanuel Nguyen uh, is an associate professor in African languages and cultures and head of the department of Cameroon languages and cultures at the Ecole Normale Supérieure of Bertois, which is uh, affiliated to the University of Nguyen-Dere, Cameroon. Professor Emmanuel is permanent research consultant at the International Center of Research in Documentation and African Languages and Traditions and director of the Archive of Languages and Oral Resource of Africa hosted at the same institution. He has published a great number of articles and a book with the title Teaching Cameroonian Languages, Theori Theoretical, Pragmatic and Didact Didactic Approaches, uh, written with Vita Cody. The title of the present lecture is Social Linguistics, making social sense of, of the discipline of linguistics in multilingual Africa. It is indeed a very interesting subject and you may begin. Okay, thank you, Paolo. Thank you, everyone. Let me share the screen with you now. Um, okay, let me turn to full mode. Okay, I hope everyone can see my screen. So uh, I want to thank um, Miguel Oliveira for inviting me to be part of this series of lecture, which are organized by the As Brazilian Association of Linguistics, Abralin. And uh, I'm also thankful for all the members of this association for the work which has been done behind the scene to make this uh, event possible. I'll not come back to my presentation. Paolo has, has done it again. So uh, this is the title of my presentation, Social Linguistics, Making Social Sense of the Discipline of Linguistics in Multilingual Africa. Of course, this could sound as a provocative uh, title uh, with uh, perhaps some ideological implication, but this is exactly what I'm going to talk to you about the next uh, one hour or so. Uh, because this is a social linguistics uh, lecture, I want to start with uh, some social, social, uh, socialization, uh, especially because um, the audience is probably coming from various parts of the world and may not be acquainted with uh, the part of the world where I find myself. So I'm speaking to you from Cameroon, right? And specifically uh, from Bertua. Bertua is located east of the capital Yaoundé, uh, about 335 kilometers 
from from the capital Yaoundé. I was intended to give this talk from uh, the the capital Yaoundé, but for professional reasons, I had to stay here um, uh, for this lecture. So before I now proceed with the presentation proper, and again because this is a social linguistics presentation, I am in an inherently social environment. And I wish to really um, kindly ask you to bear with me for any social interruption that uh, may come in the course of this lecture. As you know, African places, African homes are open spaces, uh, which are usually subject to uh, unannounced visits. I have made everything possible that this should not happen, but should it happen, I really want to, 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 to beg your patience. So, uh, there is a question that almost every linguist is likely to have faced in, in their lifetime or in their career. This question is, how many languages do you speak? Right? This is a question that we usually face, we linguists. And we tend to not really endorse the social representation of what the work of linguistics is or should be uh, from the point of view of, of social expectations. So we usually shy away by responding that well, linguistics is not about speaking languages, but why not? Why should linguists not speak many languages? Anyway, uh, for me, this is an indication of um, a psychological uh, framing of our mindset, whereby we tend to shy away, we, shan we, we tend not only to be seen as people who are active learning languages, but we really want our work to be taken seriously. So I think one of the reasons why linguists tend to shy away from being equated to polyglots and this is by no means a general rule. Of course, we know of many linguists, famous linguists around the world who speak many languages. But uh, this is something that I believe most of us have experienced, especially in, in, in the case of, of my country, right? Even though we are in the midst of a multilingual society, a multilingual environment. So one of the reasons could be pure science advocacy, right? We want to uh we want to be recognized as fully fledged scientists within the general um realm of 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 science another reason according to me could be disregard to social engagement and i'll come back to these uh to these points um in details in the next slides perhaps another historical um another reason especially in the case of uh, Africa, and of course, I want to really make it clear that even though I'll be talking about uh, Africa, I do not have any intent of uh, capturing the reality of Africa, which is very diverse from one place to another. But of course, there are similarities. There are constants that uh, keep coming back, especially in West, in West Africa, where where I where I find myself and which I am more likely to reflect in my, um, in, my, in my lecture. So there could be a historical bias stemming from the historical uh, establishment of the discipline of linguistics in, in Africa. Of course, there is also um, a possibility for neoliberalism intersecting with linguistics uh, interests, with li uh, linguistics agendas. Anyway, um, pure science advocacy have been, has been claimed by, uh, by linguists such as Newman. And I would invite you to read this um, um, statement by, by Newman uh, in his article uh, published in uh, 1998. I think it's a um, language and science journal, right? He says, and I really think he says it out of good intention. I'm 
in no way blaming him. I'm, I'm just reflecting on some um, principles, principle stance which uh, sometimes linguists adopt vis-a-vis -vis the social work uh, which, could, which linguistics could involve. He says, I'm troubled by the notion that we should spend half our time doing what I'll call linguistic social work. I know that this is an unfashionable position in the late 1990s, but I would, I, I would argue that there is value in pure fundamental research and that as scientists, we have to resist the ever pressure. Uh, I, I can't uh, see the, the, anyway, you can read uh, the screen with me because part of my screen is shaded by, by, um, uh, by that uh, sub screen, which is being, but everyone can read it. And Newman is overtly against linguists engaging in uh, social work, what he calls social work, because these, according to him, would undermine the work of science proper. Well, we will come back to it in a while. There is also, we could argue, disregard to social work for many reasons. Well, Newman again argues that linguists shouldn't care about social work. And this is something that is really vibrant, which is really very central to theoretical linguistics, uh, where we have witnessed um, a turn and uh, from early uh, linguistics research, which was called anthropology to theoretical linguistics where uh, fieldwork was, was, was not an imperative and where most of the insight gained into the functioning of uh, the human language was, was, um, was produced, uh, was the product of in introspection and of uh, intellectual um, um, reflection, right? I have also mentioned a historical bias in the linguistics of, of Africa. And I think the establishment of the discipline of linguistics in Africa, again, at least in West Africa, was part and parcel of the cultural package brought about by colonialism. There hasn't been any time in history where this legacy has been questioned. But we are founded to doubt about the good intentions of colonial linguistics. Yet, even today, uh, some of the legacy, or even most of the legacy of this uh, colonial linguistics is still prevailing, is still very authoritative in, in, in the works that we linguists are carrying out in present day linguistics research. Neoliberalism could also be one reason why social work is not valued, especially because entrepreneurial freedom of linguistic research is assumed to be scientifically neutral. And there is an assumption that science operates in a neutral space, right? In a neutral space where the objects of research uh, um, uh, may be found. I, I just wonder how recipro reciprocal this would be, right? Most of the linguistics work, as, at least field work, is done in parts of the, well, in, in, in the global south, including Africa, uh, Latin America, and parts of Australia. I just wonder how reciprocal this uh, free freedom of linguistics, of scientific entrepreneurial would be if uh, we Africans had to move from Africa to another places, to other places in, in, in the world. Well, I'll draw your attention to, to illustrate what I'm saying to a very interesting and authoritative piece of um, literature in linguistics, which is the handbook of descriptive fieldwork. Well, if you take a time to peruse this, this work, you will be very troubled, especially as an African, by the consideration 
the representation given to the notion of field work. Because field work is env envisaged as a centrifugal orientation. It is people moving from the West to non-Western parts. This is why a, methodol a methodological uh, book like this would will give specific um, prescriptions about fieldwork preparation, about ethics, about the choice of language. So field worker, the field worker in this book is clearly not expected to be like Africa, uh, well, an African or someone originating from say minority speakers or minority languages or languages which are the object of interest in fieldwork research. So again, this is not a blame, but this is just a reflection on some of the biases that uh, I would say pervade uh, the, um, well, what would pervade scientific undertakings in, 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 in linguistics, in linguistics research. Uh, sorry, I'm having somebody's because I'm operating from my from my phone having a call is likely to okay I'm I'm sorry I, I have to move forward right okay now um can scientific agendas in linguistics claim universal universality is science is linguistic a purely enterprise, a neutral enterprise, I doubt so. And we have seen in the, uh, the history of linguistics, right, a number of moves, a number of stances, which were overtly uh, implementing, let's say, a political agenda or ideological agenda. And this is the case of the linguistics of Aryan in India, as much as Kultur morphology in, in, in Germany, which was part of a broader undertaking known as social, uh, social, social linguistics. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry for my spelling of, of German. Well, in the remainder of this talk, in the remainder of this lecture, I am going to take you through a number of steps which will um, which will start from justifying the rationale behind what I call social linguistics or what I understand to be social linguistics. Then I will attempt a definition of social linguistics, at least with consideration to the, uh, the African context. Then uh, because social linguistics is not per se a novel idea. It may reflect it in other linguistics research, especially in applied linguistics, but I'll try to show the discrepancy between these two fields, these two areas of, of linguistic research. Then I will try to compare all with uh, within the same move, I'll try to see the limitation of language documentation with regard to social engagement. And I would propose a way to operationalize social linguistics, especially in, in West Africa. Uh, I, I am not intending to say that this is um, a task which is void of uh, obstacles. And I will try to raise a number of challenges and pitfalls which loom, which loom uh, around this, this, this idea which may be new, but perhaps which is not that new to, to some of you. And then I will conclude. So I expect this to last for the next uh, 40 to 50 minutes or so. Let's proceed. What rationale behind social linguistics or linguistics dwelling on social work? I think language related issues are pervasive in Africa. This is the case in nation state building. As is familiar to many of you, Africa uh, has been, well, it's 
the, 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 the national borders which we have today are, a, are products of a recent colonial history. And national borders were not defined in consultation with uh, local the local population with the result that we have many cross border languages in Africa, people who in the fortnight found themselves separated uh, you know, on both sides of, 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 of the border or two national borders. So this is nation, nation building is a crucial issue that linguistics needs to address in which linguistics plays a central role. And of course, uh, uh, the Academy of um, um, African Academy of Languages, which is an institution of the African Union, is uh, running several projects and has really uh, carried out many conferences to try to promote the use of cross-border languages. But I think many other issues, just as wars, could, found, could find solutions in linguistics uh, research, at least if linguistics could address this problem. You may have heard about uh, Boko Haram perpetrating a number of, um, uh, well, waging wars in a number of countries, Cameroon, Nigeria, Niger, and Chad. Well, according to some uh, historians, people who have studied the, the, um, this crisis, these people usually operate from one border to another with a lot of ease because some of the time people from the same border just speak the same language. So this, if these realities are not taken into consideration in, in national policies, if the military is not trained to take stock of the linguistic reality of these uh, spots, well, the response, government response may not be uh, really efficient. We also have the issue of urban settlement. Take any city, any major city in West Africa, you will see that the settlement is mapping, is mapped onto the ethnic or social or language realities, language ecology of, 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 of the country. Take any place like Lagos, Lagos, Yaounde, Douala. You will have places where are uh, reputedly inhabited by say Hausa, others who are inhabited by say Yoruba, others who are inhabited by say Igbo, et cetera, et cetera. Now, how in any uh, urban uh, policy, uh, having to do with, say, healthcare, how would you not take into consideration the fact that people who live in a certain place speak a certain language? And then perhaps if we have to send a nurse, a doctor to work with them, he should be knowledgeable in the language of, of that area. In the place where I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to you from, which is Betwa, so is the reality. We have places which are inhabited by, by migrants, by, immigra uh, by, by um, refugees, people who have moved all the way from other countries or from the northern part of, of, of the country to flee um, desertification and other, other social plagues. And who have settled there? How would you, how would the government address their reality if not accounting for the language they speak? Education, of course, is, uh, can be, uh, it has been addressed in, in the last one. So environment, well, most of our child, our, our children, I mean, do not speak our languages. We have failed, the generation to which I belong has failed to transmit language heritage to our children. Well, this has very, very uh, significant impact and uh, implications for let's say the preservation of nature. I, for myself, I know many um, um, plant, plants which, which are used in, in um, uh, let's say traditional medicine, right? So I care for these plants because I know they are helpful for my healthcare. 
Now, if my children are not aware of this, of these realities, and these realities are transmitted through language, as you know, how would they care about this? So there are obvious implications, as has been, of course, demonstrated in many linguistics research around the world. So overall, I have the feeling that the discipline of linguistics is of low impact on most language, on most social issues in, in Africa. I, I'll come back to the issue of Boko Haram in, in Cameroon and in Nigeria. We have heard historians about this crisis. We have heard politicians. We have heard economists. We have heard sociologists. We have heard anthropologists. We haven't heard much from linguists, right? And perhaps you, all, you have also heard about the Anglophone crisis, because just as a reminder, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, the political rally of Cameroon, reality of Cameroon, Cameroon is a bilingual, officially bilingual country. So we have two official languages as the result of our colonial legacy. So we witnessed um, um, uh, British and uh, French colonization. So as a result, the two languages were adopted after independence in 1960s as um, well, uh, as the two, lang the, the two official languages and uh, well, independent and subsequent reunification that ensued, right? And for three years or about now, we have been witnessing social political unrest in the English speaking parts. We are, the country is made up of 10 regions, two of which are English speaking. So the two regions are heavily affected by that crisis, leading to, I think, thousands of, of, of killings, leading to massive displacement and other social um, um, plagues, right? But this is a notoriously linguistic issue. And I'll show, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate it in, 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 in the slides uh, at some point in, in this lecture. Perhaps linguists, Linguists have had to address this, but I'm afraid the quality or uh, the branding of their research, uh, of their research products is not in such a way that polit politicians, policy decision makers can be interested in invested, investing in, 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 in linguistics research. So, Low impact, poor attractiveness from, let's say, from the students, right? And consequently, little funding. And according to me, this may be questionable, no demonstrated social relevance. I'm talking from the point of view of a linguist living in West Africa, and this reality may not be true in every place in the world. Let's take this, the case of UNICEF, which is operating in many parts of the world, especially in Africa. Well, the, the multiple indicator cluster survey of UNICEF, mix five, did not include any indicator, any social indicator alluding to language out of 130 indicators. You can check it with the 2015 uh, uh, UNICEF's mixed report. There was an improvement or there has been in, an improvement in the mix six questionnaire, which includes one indicator out of 176. Well, in a social environment, where multilingualism is such a dominant reality, where, where multilingualism and language issues suffuses any aspect of life, how would a socially informed uh, research neglect the impact of languages? These are questions that I kept asking myself over, over the time, right? And the only indicator that alludes to language is listed uh, under section learn of, of the questionnaire and 
specifically on the item LN20, which has to do with, and I quote, school and home languages. Well, we could debate on what is a school and a home language, especially in Africa. But this perhaps gives you a hint about the neglect of uh, taking into consideration the impact of the language reality into the social life. And this has been seen in either government, government um, addresses, government responses. And what is critical, according to me, is that we linguists are failing to do so equally. Now, I'll turn on to define, to provide a very sketchy definition of my understanding of social linguistics, which is not social linguistics. I define this as the study of the verbal behaviors, which is languaging, with primary account to the social life of the people whose verbal, uh, who enact such verbal behavior. The focus here is on social linguistics. That is linguistics caring for the social life of the people, not linguistics operating from social structures such as um, sex, age, uh, education. These to me are well, very relevant uh, aspect of, of the society, but these are sometimes permanent categories. The notion of gender, the notion of sex, the notion of uh, age could be dynamic depending on the context where one is situated. I think social life is fluid, changing and context dependent. So fixed permanent categories which are transposed from one reality to another, um, well, may be true, but sometimes they may need some readaptation or at least some reinterpretation with regard to the, the, the new reality. So I really advocate a socially oriented linguistics in multilingual Africa. And from a strictly personal point of view, I do not see any relevant in what I call contemplative linguistics. And if you go to any of our faculties in West Africa, this is not something that I've been able to, to uh, show you here, but I've done it in a previous, previous research. When you look at papers that are presented in linguistic conferences in Africa or about Africa, well, the overwhelming majority of these, uh, of these uh, papers or presentations are related to theoretical linguistics, which I call contemplative linguistics. I think in a multilingual Africa, where there is, uh, again, I, I have a hard time reading, but of, of course you have, you, you can read because part of my, my, my screen is hidden from me. Uh, I think that the cultural drift, which is being triggered by massive shift in language behavior will inevitably spell the demise of the continuity of our ancestral social life. In the cities, in Cameroon, perhaps not in every part of Africa, in Cameroon, it has been demonstrated. It has been uh, surveyed. Close to 60% and even more of the children do not speak their heritage language. These have significant consequences on the type of life that they will lead in the future, on the type of food that they will eat, on the type of representation that they will have, on the type of anthropological references that they will have. So this is, we are witnessing a significant drift in our cultural life. We could sit there and, and, and think, well, this is, uh, evolution at work. Uh, the weaker organisms have to die and um, 
the most powerful have to survive. Well, we could all uh, also argue the same thing with, uh, you know, uh, ecology, with the environment. We could let the environment die because this is something that is happening. No, I don't think that every evolutional, um, uh, every change in evolution is something that could just be, just be let go. We have to ensure the continuity of our social life and language is a central component of the social life, right? Um, of course, I've, I've mentioned that I don't believe in neutral science. And this is why I believe that we have to reframe not only the conceptual apparatus from which we operate, but also adapt the methodologies as well as the agendas of the linguistics, of linguistics discipline to reflect our, our problems. And perhaps may, many of you, as you listen to me, you may ask, well, this is just maybe a recycling of what is it's been done, especially within the realm of applied linguistics. Of course, applied linguistics is involved in social work. We see it in language and education, language and gender, language and globalization, all these issues that are really, uh, strictly that uh, uh, relate closely to social life. But I've pointed out the fact that the conceptual apparatus, the theoretical grounding of this linguistics of applied linguistics draws from standard concepts, standard categories, which may be valid, but may not always be valid in our African context. The same can be said about language documentation, which is clearly for the preservation of language heritage and much money Time and human resources have been invested in this, but I'll try to show you that if not, uh, if not reflected critically with accordance to the social reality where it is applied, these enterprises may end up having unintended consequences, right? Okay, I, I think I've, 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 I've mentioned it, but notions such as mother tongue, L1, L2, et cetera, et cetera, are usually believed to be universal. But take a child in a village, let's say in a Bati village where I've worked, who speaks six languages and who adjusts himself according to the social momentum Tell me what is his mother tongue. Tell me what is his L1. Tell me what is his L2. I don't know, but perhaps we should look into it and try to really critically address it. Standard dialect, language standardization. There's like a, uh, the idea that we have to kind of uh, minimize language language diversity, because language diversity has, is turning out to be seen as a problem, as a challenge, as a problem, rather than an asset. So if you see language diversity as a problem, especially for national unity, this is something that I've heard on and on. It, we would be, we would live in a better world if we were speaking only one language. Oh, right? Is it, is it that true? I don't believe so because we have many places in the world where people speak only one language, but where the most, uh, the most cruel, uh, you know, um, barbarism have, have taken place. So I am not sure that having many languages in the social space or in a political space is a, is a problem. The problem is how you theorize, how you conceptualize, how you approach this. So if you want to standardize, okay, go for it. But 
you have to take into consideration the expectation of all the stakeholders. You don't design writing material. You don't write, design a writing system because you are a linguist and impose it on the others and let the others uh, use your standard dialect because you are a linguist. And this is something that is happening. And I'm, I'm heading a department uh, where we teach, we train teachers of national language, where some of these, uh, let's say, ideolo ideologies about standards are not working, where people are standing against, uh, against what they consider to be some sort of local colonialism. Uh, people in power trying to rule, rule over others. So these are, are not neutral uh, contents. Monolingualism, bilingualism, multilingualism uh, is part of what I've just said. Okay, now coming to language documentation, of course, language documentation has been welcomed in Africa as an undertaking which addresses the urgency of language preservation. Because as we know, but of course there are debates about whether some of Af the African languages are really endangered or not. And I'm thinking about uh, Professor Mufwene, if, if, if he's, uh, if, if he's, uh, he's uh, watching this, this lecture, he, he, he has a different uh, reflection, stance about uh, the fate of African languages. But we can see it in our families. We can see it in our communities that our languages, our heritage, our cultural heritage is not being transmitted any, anymore. So this is a reality in most part of Africa and language documentation has been welcomed as uh, a move that will perhaps give social sense to the discipline of linguistics. No surprise that it has attracted many many African linguists, especially because it also came with a lot of funding opportunities, of course. But I would argue that language documentation is driven by the agenda of the funders exclusively. So somebody sitting somewhere, say in London, Washington or Paris, with every good intention, decides what is good for my language here in Bertua and what is not good. Well, since the person owns the money, they have to decide. But is it the way we Africans want to go? Do we want to assuage? Do we want to, I mean, do we want to be so? subjected to external agendas on the ground that we are looking for funding? Is it really that we don't have local funding to save our languages? These are questions that I usually ask myself and which are the uh, real motivation be behind the emergence in my mind of an idea of culturally or socially motivated linguistics. The focus in most of these enterprises, language documentation enterprises are on data. I usually call it data drilling. So researchers come in Africa with a lot of well, with funding for their stay. They harness data, they collect data and go back, store them, in archives in places accessible or easily accessible only to them and easily uh, well exploitable because there is a whole science of data if you are not trained to interrogate data to mine data you may not get the best of it who are the people who are better trained in language data they are the worst so we are left to just uh, see language data being drilled. Of course, claim should, could be made of the fact that this is 
good intention initiatives, and I believe they are good intention. I myself have had a grant with uh, ELGP to document a language, but precisely some of the questions, some of the issues that I'm raising in this lecture, this lecture started uh, emerging from my experience, from the three year experience documenting this language. I have to face with the social reality of the people whose language I was documenting. I had to go there with heavy duty equipment. I had to go there, uh, record, film them, film hungry women and children, then go with my data because I have an agenda. I have to abide by the contract which I had signed. I had to drill data to fool my research needs, which eventually has an impact on my pro uh, professional promotion, but which has little or no impact or even a harmful impact on the population whose language I am documenting. And most of the funding in language documentation is granted at this language documentation being carried out in Africa is granted to non-Africans. And is explicitly at odds with social work. There is provision, explicit provision in some of, I, was, I don't want to name, well, let me name ELGP, why not? In ELGP frame of, framework of funding that um, Feed work should not involve any social work like building, I don't know, hospitals, bridges. Well, this is, you have to make a choice. You cannot do everything, but is there not any avenue for blending these issues together, carrying purely documentary scientific work along with social work? This is my stance. I'm not against language documentation. I have benefited from this. And I believe this is relevant work. I believe it. But once you end up, when once you end your project, what next? What next? So just to give you an idea of the unbalanced sharing of language documentation funding across the world. This is a plot which I've generated in, in, in one of my recent publications, where language documentation being carried out in Africa represents only a tiny portion of the funding compared to what is what accrues to researchers in USA and Europe. And Newman again has critically address this issue but i advocating that field work research in in let's say well, africa and other parts or less in those parts of the world should be carried out by natives at least by people who were located there this is not something this is not a, a blame which i'm directing against the west i'm directing it against us how much how many of our students, how much of our curriculum, our curricula addresses issues of language documentation? How much training is being provided in language documentation in our African faculties? I am very skeptical about this issue being the top of the priorities in our, in, in our training. So I'll not turn out to the last uh, major component of, of this lecture, which is, okay, how do we go about? How do we operationalize social linguistics? Again, this is not an epistemological shift. It, I, I would need, uh, it, 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 there would be need to theorize it, to come up with a grid of concept that really operationalizes it. I am talking about a paradigmatic shift. I would, I would even talk about a programmatic shift. 
That is what social linguistics is about. Reconsideration of the conceptual apparatus in linguistics to reflect Africa's perception and representation of verbal experience. And one of these concepts that I think have deeply undermined the relevance of linguistic work in Africa is the notion of language, the very notion of language. Let me be more specific. I believe our perception in West Africa, in Africa, broadly speaking, because this is something that I, I keep checking every time I meet an African. The first question I ask him is, okay, how do you say I speak, right? And how do you say languages? And this is also a question that I think Professor Mufwene uh, has, has, um, has asked to many researchers. And I think he, he made an online so survey about it, which I've which I responded to. So I think that the verbal reality, the social reality of speaking is one which is, if we want to keep the notion or the term language should be, uh, sh should apply to languaging rather than to languages. Why languaging? and not languages. And uh, this is a notion that Sabino has used in the uh, title of his book published in 2018, and which I totally endorse. The generally held view that languages are entities is purely anal an analytical and not factual, according to me. And someone has written somewhere that Every time you write a grammar of, say, a given lect, you have issued a birth certificate to that lect to stand on its own. You have endowed that lect with an army, uh, and what else again? I can't remember the full the full citation. But this is this seems to me to be very important because. If once you create a reality, once you start providing literature for that created reality, you start right creating a reality which sometimes may be distant from the social reality. I tend to view human verbal experiences like well, viewing, excuse me, viewing human verbal experiences like st stabilizing, stabilized entities of like fluid networks of relationships entails radically different heuristics undertakings. So either we see linguistics as systems, stable, stabilized systems, or are dynamic networks of behavior has critical consequences on the product that we deliver, on the concept that we operationalize, and on the methodology that we implement. And I have titled another article, which is in press, Had Sosu Spoken Basa of or, or Wolof, or not of, or Wolof? The discipline of linguistics would have fared differently. Why do I say it? As you know, Saussure draws a distinction between lang and paro, right? Lang being the stable system of rules from which we draw in, in use, and paro being the factual use of the system by individuals at any time in society. So lang and parole have a very strong, very powerful categories in social linguistics. Well, if we come down to the African reality, and I'm showing you a sample of lexemes about these two notions in my language, which is Basa, the first, uh, the, the, 
the third line, language, lang is hop and parole is hop. In Bambara, Mali and Guinea, language is can, parole is can. Bemba, Zambia, Soso and Soso, and on and on and on and on. Again, this is not to say that this uh, data re reflects uh, the entireness of the verbal reality of Africa. I'm just saying that if Sosu had spoken some of these languages, what would have been his stance vis-a-vis -vis the relationship between a systemic representation and the use? Because in my language, as per our cognitive representation of the verbal behavior, we see language, and let me start quoting now, putting in quote, language as a fluid, which is what, why I mentioned languaging. That is the process rather than a stable reality. So my, if I speak, this is my, well, if I say hope when, which is, well, my speech or my way of speaking, hope can, could apply to a group of people, to a community. And it also applies to other notions such as discourse, such as uh, justice, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really a dynamic. Now, I believe science to explain nature. And when it comes to social nature, or social reality, I think science should draw from what is what has significant to the social reality. So if we now operationalize the notion or linguistics notion building from a languaging perspective, rather than a language perspective, how would our grammars look like? How would our dictionaries look like? How would the notion of mother tongue, um, L1, L2 multilingualism look like? I don't have fixed answers to this. This is work in progress. I hope to, uh, be, uh, to be able to respond to, to, to some of this question. So uh, ironically, in Cameroon, we don't know how many languages we have. People who believe or who think that language is a plain concept have not been able to tell how many languages we have. At least if languages were objects in the nature like mountains, like rivers, like trees, we shouldn't have a hard time counting them. But look at the figures in this table, 239, 248, 267, again and again. And I have my own figures because I believe to have discovered in court at least one language in court in the course of my language documentation. So how many languages do we have? I think the problem is not the methodologies uh, implemented in, in, in language count. I think it's with the notion of language. It doesn't reflect our social reality. Now look at this uh, chart, which uh, is kind of a tree representation of the um, um, language, uh, language families, right? If you go from one end, say Jukunoit on the right end or, and uh, from the right or from the left to the right, what the tree shows you is a hierarchical branching of generic relationships. It doesn't tell you anything about what this branch may have in common with this other branch. There could be significant cultural and social realities being closed from one branch to another than within languages belonging well, I still use the term languages. You can judge how 
powerful, uh, uh, you know, uh, ideologies. And language, I believe, is an ideological, uh, you know, reality. Oh, okay, just bear with me using it for the moment. So how do you tell about the relationship, possible relationship? And I've tried to look into the counting systems of, of African language. The language is drawing from the available, the, um, available, um, well, um, catalog of number systems. Well, there's some uh, number systems of the world, something like that. At, at least it is um, published by the Max Planck Institute for Anthropological Linguistics, and everyone can, can view it. If you look at the way groups count, you may find close relationships between unexpected languages, and the same applies to people, groups claiming the same origin, the same history, the same ancestors, the same, let's say, um, customs, the same rights, the same religion, language, of course, in as much as language dwell only with land in social dichotomy, there's no justification for language caring for culture or for social reality. But I'm now in a perspective where the two are blended. And this leads to a completely different, different representation of our verbal experiences. In most um, maps, linguistics maps, languages are shown as dots, right? This is language one, two, three, three, or A, B, C, D, dot. L languages are represented as dotted verbal spaces. Well, I don't believe in languages being spotted or being fixed because there is no language. There are only people who use, who have a verbal behavior. So you can only account for that language from the social life of the people. Now, if a group of people, as we have seen in recent years, move from one place to another, say, move from Central Africa to Bertua, where I find myself, where you have sometimes thousands and thousands of refugees. You still believe Betwa not to be the place of, let's say, Sango, because Sango is not spotted in. Well, OK, perhaps you understand what, what I mean. I'm, I'm sorry to, to go emotional sometimes in, in my talk. And of course, because language the notion of language presupposes pre-existing reality, pre-existing entities, which linguists have to discover and classify. This results in labels, artificial labels being mapped onto social realities. Just look at this. We have a language, or should I call it language? I don't know, Mambila, right? Cameroon Mambila, Nigerian Mambila. What does that mean, Cameroon Mambila? We know that Cameroon and Nigeria are colonial and very recent in history, very recent realities. How do we want to reflect on the social, on the history, on what these people have in common if we label them as Cameroon Mambila and Nigerian Mambila? There is sense in doing so. I understand, but Precisely, social linguistics should take from this step to build on an alternative reality on top of this reality, which is relevant, of course, because we, we, we need to do classificatory work. We need to do typological work. We need to do descriptions. But I'm just saying that on top of this work, there should be carried out an alternative uh, work that has social relevance. Adama fulfill day. Ba give me fulfill day. Borgo fulfill day. Central Eastern Niger fulfill day. Okay, do, do these people really refer to themselves as Central Eastern Niger fulfill day? I doubt so. Masina fulfill day. Hausa states fulfill day. Very interesting. Hausa states fulfill day. Why? Federalism in Nigeria is very recent. Perhaps this language was not existing before the state. Western Niger, Fufule, et cetera, et cetera. 
these are labels necessary for the rational inquiry of a typologist, of course, but how relevant are they? And if you look at the Cameroonian Atlas uh, of languages, you find that, and this is a work that I'm, I'm, I'm currently conducting on uh, anthroponyms, how skewed most, most, uh, most of these names have been. Most of the names that we see in atlases do not reflect the names that people have of themselves. These are very significant uh, realities because if you write a grammar on say, um, well, I don't know, Western Nigeria full full day, whereas people speaking this language in coach refer to themselves with a different, you know, ethnonym. To whom have you written this grammar? Are they ready to take over this piece of literature in which you have invested time and money and, you know, resources? Well, I don't know. So, I suggest that we move them from, this is part of the social linguistics agenda, moving from generic atlases, there are other components, to socially meaningful atlases. And this is what I mean by socially meaningful atlases. I, I, I could have shown you um, in three dimensions uh, this chart, but I, I, I I better not to because we are running out of time and I have to, to, to now rush. Um, so just let me take five minutes to explain you this chart. So you have the labels uh, left, which I just give to any name, verbal behavior, recognize verbal behavior if you want language, right? Region, so look, look at uh, the first uh, colored line uh, on the top where you have lect region, cultural group, and language area. So if you look at the chart, uh, you can see that we have Basa as a lect, we have Bancon as a lect, we have Bakoko in the center, we have uh, Malimba on the bottom left, you ha we have Dwala um, on, on the right, you have Mokwe more or less in the middle, you have Barombi. Right, so let's call them languages or whatever you want. Now, classification, present classification tell us that Basa, Bakoko, Bangon belong to the Basa, let's say, language cluster. Okay, this is really plausible because if you look at the lexicons of this, of this lect, you really see a high degree of lexical resemblances. You also have another group called Duala, which have renamed Sawa after their cultural naming. But in the linguistic atlas, they are called Sawa. I don't, I do not, I do not want to have two clashing labels in my chat. So Sawa, look at it on, on, the, um, on the right, close to the bottom, Sawa, which is, um, well, yeah, I, I don't know the color. We, we, I, I have names for very little colors in my language. So I have uh, almost, always have a hard time naming colors. Anyway, you can see Sawa somewhere here uh, towards uh, left. And languages that belong to that language group, language cluster are, oh, I'm sorry, let me come back. Uh, Barombi, no, no, uh, uh, not Barombi, excuse me. Um, oh, I did not branch them. That is, that is, uh, that is a mistake. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry because of course I had to run a code to generate them. But anyway, what I want to show you is that, for example, take, uh, let's come back to Bancon, Basa, and et cetera. You can see that Bancon and Barombi and again, you have another category for region, which is in, in blue. You had Southwest, the name of the name uh, inside the label is not, uh, um, well, it's not complete, but if I uh, maximize uh, the size of the label, 
this is going to be seen. So we have only three of them, Southwest on the right, we have Central, which is the names of our administrative regions on, 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 on the, the left, on the top left, and the littoral uh, um, uh, at the bottom, right? We can see that Barombi is spoken in the Southwest, which is not trivial. I've taken this because the language crisis that we are having today stems from the fact that English speaking uh, fellow citizens uh, think that they are marginalized with regard to their linguistics and civil rights. So these are pe people claiming a linguistic identity, which is different from their ancestral or their ethnic language identity. Now, while Barombi is located in Southwest, while belonging to language cluster Basa, um, Bakoko, for example, which also belongs to the same language cluster along with Banton is located in the Francophone zone. So you see this very interesting uh, aspect of the social reality in Cameroon. And these have not been stressed enough to show that while the English identity may be a reality, but there are other reasons for being for, for people coming close to one another, for people overcoming their differences and not building up their, let's say, um, their frustration on issues that I would say do not really speak to, to, to well, this is, this may not be true, this, this may be subjective, but I think we could really try to, we linguists, try to emphasize these type of relationships in, 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 in our society. Well, if you see this, this, this really builds on existing classification. I have not ruled out existing classification because uh, for one reason, I have, I have not, uh, I, I do not have any counter analysis that will go against what is existing. So I beat on them, but I equally draw other parallels, which create a network of interconnection. For example, I create types of relationships um, about the level of intelligibility. Okay, when we say that there is mutual intelligibility, these are usually binary categories, mutual or non well, mutual intelligibility or non-mutual intelligibility. We don't see the way that society really uh, expresses this reality. Like, I don't speak, what? Well, I speak only language X a little. Oh, I speak language Y, very good. I speak language B averagely. So these are social representations of language use which I think in a socially meaningful atlas should be reflected. So I, I don't have time to comment on every, but um, uh, you can see that every edge which describe a relationship has a label, like, as I said, is highly intelligible to, is averagely intelligible to, is uh, almost not intelligible to, is not intelligible to. And you could see that languages that belong to different groups would have people claiming intelli mutual intelli uh, intelligibility, not on the ground of the resemblances between the linguistic material of both groups, but in, by virtue of the type of interaction. Let me just take a very brief example. I'm, I'm coming to the end of my lecture. If I take the case of Douala, Douala is a uh, name of, of a group. It's also, it's also the name of the um, economic as, uh, capital of, of the country. So there is 
Douala, the, the Douala language is really prestigious in Cameroon. And this is something that I've, I've seen over the years with my students. Every time they have to choose a language to learn between Douala and say another language, there is high chance that they will choose Douala. So there is um, a social prestige associated with Douala, which justifies the fact that even though Bancon, which belongs to the Basa uh, language cluster, even though Bancon is not intel intelligible to a Douala uh, speaker, Douala as a language is intelligible to Bancon because of social adjustment. So these are the types of um, variables. These are the types of, I would say, um, explanations that social linguistics is likely to bring on top of existing linguistics classification and atlases. Of course, this is not uh, this applying implementing social linguistics doesn't go without any challenge, right? Um, the first one is how can we, how are we able to reshape the linguistic agenda in the academy? I've mentioned the fact that very, 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 very little faculties offer training in language documentation in Africa, for example, just to mention that. And I think language documentation with local agendas should be a priority because you don't connect people if you don't know about their cultural life, their social life. If you don't have information that relevantly connects one another. In the absence of this information, linguistics, ling linguists, uh, excuse me, linguists are bound to work with, I would say, first-hand information, word list, elicited information, in the state of carrying out extensive surveys on the life, the social life, the cultural life of the people to generate data bundles that aggregate these uh, parameters together. Of course, this calls for a renewal in methodology and of course, interdisciplinarity. I've shown you a, um, the previous, in the previous um, 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 graph that I've, I've just shown you. Of course, this, I could do, I, I am comfortable doing it now because we have the facilities provided by uh, digital technologies. These could not be achieved like in the 80s where this classification were. So we have to acknowledge the fact that uh, Science is also dependent on history, on the historical, or on historical historiography. Uh, in the, you could not ask someone to represent language as an interaction with social reality in three dimensions. This was not possible. Today we are able to do it. So I think digital methods to linguistics can play a crucial role because this enables multimedia language documentation through video audio recordings. This enables aggregation of diverse resources together, images, audios, videos, text. This enables new modes of visualization, which of course, yield new insight into, into that which could not be seen, which could not be, which was not exposed to the eye of, of the linguist. There are also possible pitfalls uh, in social linguistics. There is risk of political entrenchment because 
every time that you deal with social realities or cultural realities, especially in a multilingual setting, you run the risk of essentializing uh, people and their groups. So this is a possible pitfall which we should be aware uh, about if we want to embark on social linguistics. Of course, political entrenchment can easily lead to ethnopolitics, as was the case in Germany with um, uh, Kulturmorphologie. I'm sorry for the pronunciation. Also, the risk of factual or subjective account of the social reality at the expense of theorization, because we need theories, we need concept that capture the reality. We cannot only operate in science from plain reality. But what I want to make clear is that social reality is meaningful and it should be meaningful to everyone interested in part of that social reality and linguists and linguistics is clearly uh, clearly deals with social, the social reality. So to conclude, I would suggest coordination and cooperation. This is what I wanted, I, I, I meant instead of coordination and coordination across national borders. There is little information circulating from one border to another. Again, Akalan is doing a great job in trying to bring people together. But even in the age of Zoom, in the age of Facebook, WhatsApp, and all the, the means that we have now at the disposal to talk to each other, still very little information is shared across borders by linguists. Uh, we need to agree on common standards, on good practices, because social realities are usually congruent from one place to another across borders. And I think we need a common language infrastructure for Africa. There won't be much sense if every single faculty in Africa creates their own archive. Of course, that would be something good, but that will entail specific uh, methodologies, ways of collecting, organizing data and storing it. This will probably um, uh, result in, in further uh, barriers, further uh, well, confinement to use a term which is very fashionable in this time. So I think Akalan again, should take leadership in lobbying to the government, to the organizations for a common language infrastructure for Africa. And to end, I think all of this cannot happen if there is lack of social awareness and social engagement from linguists because we are dealing with a critically social reality, which is, and I'll call it again, out of ideological confinement and constraining languages. Thank you very much for all for following. I was intending to speak for one hour. I've spoken for almost one and a half hour, but I think I'm still in the slot, the two hour slot that um, I was given to me. I'm now open to your questions. Thank you very much. Thanks for your excellent lecture. Uh, and I do thank everybody's presence. I will put uh, you a few questions uh, formulated 
there were many comments and uh, and questions. Uh, first uh, question um, placed by Bert. Um, doesn't restricting your definition to verbal behavior prevent you from looking at language policy? Isn't that restricting the social too much? Is the first question. Um, I'll, I'll beg your pardon. Could you please repeat the question? I, I didn't get it. I get just part of it. I'm sorry. Okay. Doesn't a restrict a restricting your definition to verbal behavior prevent you from looking at language policy? Isn't that restricting the social too much? Yes, I, I, I think uh, social, the social reality is a very broad notion, right? Uh, yes. Which of course is very hard to capture in just uh, a piece of lecture such as this one, as you could, uh, you could get it from my presentation. This is not a definitive uh, well, definition of, of, of social linguistics. This is maybe just a, a path, path breaking, right? Attempt to attract the attention of linguists on those very urgent social issues, which, are, which I feel are more or less neglected by linguists. But where linguists are in the position of, uh, are in a better position to address these issues than other, let's say the other humanists like historians. So this is just an advocacy for more social awareness by African linguists because we are really overwhelmed in the, in the good sense, in the positive sense by the social reality, but then, of course, uh, there are political aspects to it, which, which of course I didn't address. Uh, I, I do agree that this definition is, 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 is partial and incomplete and needs so, of course, needs to be refined and completed. But at least this is just as I have said, a path breaking, um, uh, well, attempt to attract the attention of, of, of linguists on, on that issue. Thank you. Uh, second question, uh, placed by Marcia Machado Vieira. Mm -hmm. To what extent the linguists' conceptualization of social representations is good? A, by previous sociolinguistic practice, based on permanent categories, under the claim of making it possible to compare different linguistic re realities documentations, or B, by the difficulties involved in the process of e effectively knowing the social particularities of a language community. Okay, okay, thank you for that question. So, uh, of course, um, as a linguist, I, I was trained in mainstream linguistics. So, of course, I cannot escape, uh, you know, my previous linguistics uh, practice as, as, uh, as uh, Marciado Santos has, has put it. Um, to what extent does it influence um okay um so he says uh let me let me read again uh okay um all right well to to what extent does does it influence you know comparison between different linguistic realities well i think this is something that needs to emerge from not from not from the linguist person per se uh, I wish to draw your attention on the fact that I really put emphasis on documentation. And documentation 
is not built on social linguistics categories. Social linguistics is meant to be um, a practice that aims at, well, um, yeah, documenting, that is capturing the social life of the people. Of course, this can never be complete, but this does not draw on, on fixed social linguistics ca category. This draws on how people use language in their daily living, right? There could be, uh, of course, the question of how exhaustive, how uh, possible is it to exhaust the social reality? But at least, uh, if we cannot exhaust it, let us start scratching it. Because as it is right now, it seems to me to uh, it seems to me to be the case that by focusing only on the linguistics aspect of linguistics, that is on language structures, and by overriding uh, the social aspect, we do not, we are not informed. Our methodologies, our agendas is not informed. And I'm talking about social linguistic as being, let's say, a political urgency, a social urgency. And uh, by the difficulties involved in process of effective knowing the social particularities of language community, that is very interesting. But some of these categories are sometimes provided by the community, right? People tell you, we see this reality that way. We see this other reality this way, right? This is the first step in sketching uh, new categories. This is very different from applying external categories to a community. You can build on existing categories to derive new categories, perhaps in comparison with existing categories elsewhere. But my advocacy is that um, there's no universal science, right? Indigenous knowledge is also a science, though maybe not operating from the same methodologies. So the reality the social life reality as reflected and expressed as worded out by the community should be valid, at least a hypothesis towards, um, you know, drawing uh, social uh, peculiarities of language, of a language community. This is not something that is given, I, I believe. And there is always, the risk of, of a bias, and I've noted it in, in, in one of my slides, my slices. Thank you. And uh, the last question placed by Alexander Kovina, which concrete methodologies and research questions would you like to see implemented? Right, uh, the right, the type of recent research question is the, to me should be informed by the context, the social context. I took the example of war and social unrest in Cameroon, right? So these realities should trigger, should be the starting point of my research questions, as opposed to just recycling research questions that have been implemented or have that, that have been researched elsewhere, which is most of the time what we see. If something is trying to apply, let's say a minimalist uh, approach, approach to syntax uh, in let's say given uh, Cameroon language, sometimes this is just to validate an assumption of the theory uh, having worked el elsewhere. So my uh, stance is that social reality should inform our research question and the methodology should be one. That includes the communities. That includes the community's perception of their reality, the community's discourse of their reality, blended with the linguists 
experience and methods, we can come up with something perhaps not strictly true uh, with regard to, let's say, standard science, but at least socially true with regard to the social reality. Let me just take a very, very short example. If like my community, the community which I belong to, claim to originate from a very mythical place in Cameroon, which is called uh, Ngoglituba. This is something that still needs to be, of course, proven uh, historically. But there are other groups who also claim to originate from, from that place. To me, whether this is fictional, uh, part of the mythology of a group, this is a social reality because myths are also realities. So these are uh, worthy research questions to start with, maybe, and extend them uh, or analyze them against uh, the, um, the backdrop of standard methodologies. I, 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 I hope to have responded to his question. Thank you. And now it's time to finish. Thanking everybody involved in drawing attention to our further program. Uh, and again, a special thanks for you, Professor Emmanuel. Follow us on Instagram and on Twitter. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you Bye. very much for everyone for listening.